Welcome to Melbourne Books. Thank you all so much for coming out today. Uh, we are so happy to be celebrating the launch of Hill Country Birds and Waters Art and Poems, uh, featuring poetry by Jim Blackburn and artwork by Isabel Scurry Chapman. I'm going to go ahead and read their bios and then welcome you up to the stage to go ahead and give us your reading. So, artist Isabel Scurry Chapman resides in Houston where she scours the landscape and old books for inspiration and spiritual connections. She has received a Mid-America National Endowment for the Arts individual grant and has shown her work across Texas, the U.S., and Mexico. Jim Blackburn is an environmental lawyer and planner who teaches civil and environmental engineering. He has published two books, The Book of Texas Bays and A Texan Plan for the Texas Coast. He is president of the Trinity Edwards Springs Protection Association, which is focused on hill country water issues. Welcome. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, Isabel, who we call Princey as well, is uh, going to join me, and uh, she'll talk a bit about her art, and I'll read a few poems and, uh, and, and talk about what we've got. But this Hill Country Birds and Waters uh, is a kind of a real uh, kind of effort of love. Uh, Garland and I have had, uh, this is my wife Garland here, it's John Chapman, these are our management team over here. <laughs> uh, we've had a house in the Hill Country since 1975 in, on Lone Man Creek in Wimberley, and it's just been a wonderful place to go hide away and to basically uh, just really kind of get re-centered in most everything we do. And more recently, there's been a lot of threats to the groundwater. I think now there's a pipeline that's proposed to come through the hill country. And so uh, this, this, uh, this set of poems and, uh, and images really are, are around the relationship that, that I and our friends and Isabel have with the hill country. And uh, so I thought that I would share today with you some of the poems about the spiritual side of the hill country and kind of kind of how the hill country began to kind of resonate with me. Isabel will talk a little bit about a couple of the different pieces of art that she brought along with her uh, to kind of just tell about how she does her art and what her thinking is. And then I'll talk about uh, read a few more poems that are really more about the environmental issues about water in the hill country and kind of the threats that are facing us and, and what we should do about it. Um, what's not being done about it. Uh, so with that, uh, let me start off with, put my glasses on so I can see what I'm doing here. And we're gonna start off with the Cardinal. I'm sorry, start off with Buick's Rim. I made, made my mind up this morning where I was just gonna uh, read poems about birds that I saw today or saw this weekend. And the first bird we saw when Girl and I got here on Friday was a Buick's red. And so I'm gonna start with that. I speak through birds. I mean, all of these images, all these poems are about birds. And I really enjoy birds and bird watching. And I have a relationship with these birds, which I'll share with you. Buick's red, at Wimberley on the porch in the early spring. The small brown bird with the striking eyebrow Flits up the length of the wrinkled bark of the live oak that's also fighting for its life in the thin and weak and dry hill country soil. The tail bobs up and down, holding the bird in place while it meets its daily need, searching the nooks and crannies for hopping, jumping, crawling protein. And then, late in the afternoon, the melody comes wafting through the, the cedars, the wren singing to my soul, a soloist in the choir of the Church of the Earth, trilling about the beauty and wonder of life, Reminding me to be grateful to be alive, reminding me to be humble about who and what I am. Sharing reality, sharing consciousness, sharing the earth with a wonderful singing wren, and the fallen Baptist in me shouts, hallelujah, brother. <laughs> so that is the type of relationship that I have. And uh, Isabel's gonna come up now and it's gonna show you one of her images, which is the northern cardinal. Uh, again, a bird that uh, you know, is very common to be seen there. But tell us a bit about you. Tell us a bit about your cardinal. Well, um, I thought I'd start out with why I did these. And I 
Jim rented another book, and I had started using birds as my spiritual advisors. The, you know, they live in the air. The air is sort of ethereal and visible. So um, with the first set, I did portraits, like you go into a building, and you see all the important people on the wall. Well, these were my advisors. <laughs> and I did them like portraits from the waist up. Uh, and I, Jim and I had not come to the book stage yet, so I had written poetry on the back. Underneath here, I picked the boxes, the cigar boxes for these edges because I love uh, Persian and the miniatures. And then I uh, tore my watercolor paper to fit in there and wrote poetry that I liked, not knowing that Jim wanted to do this with me. <coughs> so people like Rumi or Lazzo are underneath. I've always liked an underneath of words. And then I painted the bird. <laughs> and that's what I do on cigar boxes. And, and I walked into <coughs> Isabel's art studio one day, and there were all of these boxes on the wall that had uh, these beautiful birds. Uh, and I looked up there, and I said, well, I can write poems to go with that. And she said, well, do it. And so we did it. That's how, that's how we got to this uh, publication. The Northern Cardinal, the poem that goes with that painting. In Wimberley, in the Texas Hill Country, on a bright spring day. Yes, hold it up. There you go. Hold it up the whole time. I have just stopped running and am collating thoughts that course through my head as I try to find the right way to speak to an audience of friends and interested persons about my spiritual self and nature. The trees have painted the hills with the hues of early spring green. The flowers are blooming, purple, yellow, blue, and orange, welcoming the bees to come and take what they need. And then the song pierces the landscape, a song of joy, of celebration, a song of life, followed shortly by the red flash of the male cardinal heading back to his lady at the nest. This is Earth Church. This is what I'll talk about, the songs of the birds, the hues of the living plants, the dashing lizard, the circling hawk. This is my church, and I'm attending services, and they leave me peaceful, easy, and present. That's the northern part. Mm -hmm. Now, the wild turkey. I uh, didn't see the turkeys, but I've heard them this trip so far. So, uh, they, those big tops make a wonderful sound out there in the, uh, in the bottomlands. The wild turkey. Gazing from the bathroom window after showering, taking in the cedars, oaks, and fog along Lone Man Creek. And that's the creek that our house is on, on the east side of Wimbledon. The forms emerge from the fog and brush, first a gray head moving side to side, then the rest, all members of the turkey clan from the large trees down near the dam. Neighbors that give me joy each fall when they join back together after nesting, when the hens spread out to lay their eggs and raise their clutch. Live spirits traveling together as they have been for, for the time that I've been privileged to come to this sacred space here on earth. The fog's alive. The tendrils move from cedar to oak, twisting and turning, easing along the creek, one with the big birds, reminding me that the earth is a place of life and living things, reminding me that we're connected to a force, an energy far larger than me and you, truly special, a higher power that I feel this morning a welcome gift to hold and embrace, bringing a smile as I recall the Lutheran minister explaining that the earth is the essence of the Holy Spirit of the Christian Trinity, an aspect of God, reminding me that it is my church and I'm here to pray. And so my day began seeing and experiencing God from the bathroom window overlooking Lone Man Creek in the early fall outside of Winter. Now, another one of Isabel's paintings. See the wax one. So I progressed to uh, hardback book covers um, because there's a, there's a story back there. 
and I've always had something back there in the background. My earliest paintings, I put my own journals, which were boring, so I had to cover them <laughs> almost completely. Um, and I've gone to whole birds and any any part of the bird that I want to paint. And um, there's usually some little collage element on there, and that's sort of like a signature. Um, these wax wings are so beautiful in real life, and they they cluster together and hit the berry trees, and it's just wonderful. And Jim, I'm going to tell you more. <laughs> Now, I didn't see cedar waxwings on this trip. They've migrated back to the north, but um, Isabel brought the waxwing painting, so I thought I'd read the poem as well. So this is the only bird that I'll read about that we haven't seen on this trip. The sound comes from above the oaks, a soft yet pervasive whistling that signals to me that the cedar waxwings are moving through my place on earth. I search the treetops and then see the group of 30 small birds flying and then feeding together working as a group to survive, exemplifying cooperation and community. The community of waxwings descends upon the berries, each bird wearing a black eye mask, signaling membership in this cohesive group formed for mutual benefit. A group where members look after each other, warning of predators, helping find food, navigating together to their breeding grounds in the land to the north. The group of travelers find safety and security together among the oaks and fences and the homes where humans live. Humans that who are often alone and apart, working for one rather than for all. And as I see the wax wings rise and move on together, I smile and understand that we humans have much to learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, It'll get into really more of the environmental kind of activism side of this. The scrub jay. In the Texas hill country in the winter after a cold, drenching rain, the sun arrived like a long lost friend, sending photons across space. The light reflected from water that is oozing, seeping, dripping, and then flowing across the porous fractured rock that was parched and dry only yesterday. The scrub jay swoops across the landscape that is bleached gray-green, brightening up the day with its azure color, and raucous cry that tells all, this is my domain, this is my place. And as I hear the claim, I think that the jay's domain is no longer simple, but instead complicated by human actions, actions that have changed the climate, altered rainfall patterns, and affected the way that life is lived by other living things. When I hear my friend the scrub jay, I hear a proclamation of innocence, a statement from a victim of my time, and I resolve to try to make it better for other living things and for me, hoping that what we start now will reverse the trend, for we are accountable to those like the scrub jay that cannot act to save themselves. Now, I have a special relationship with the crested caracara, and this is a, an image of it that it's a, a wonderful bird of prey that's got white on all four tips. It's white tail, white head, and white wing tips. And I truly like the character. I don't know why I can't explain. But when I see a character, it changes my day and really makes it a wonderful day. Running down a hill country road and it's hot, Texas summer hot. My shaman bird appears I'm, I'm excuse me. My shaman bird approaches me head on, the white-tipped predator wanting to talk, telling me over and over, water, 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 asking me if I cleanse my feet and cool my body in the clear spring-fed Blanco River, asking me if I have been to Jacob's Well lately and visited the county park there, a place of leisure, a place of rebirth, just like Blue Hole downstream on Cypress Creek. Asking me if I've been to San Marcos or New Braunfels to see the magic of water bursting from the ground, bringing life in its way. Asking me why not? Asking me what I've done about the many straws that threaten to suck the lifeblood of this holy place called the Hill Country. We go our separate ways, my conscience searching for food, and my body heading down to Deer Lake to bathe in the cool water that recreates me for another day, another week, 
recreation that requires the nourishing, life-giving water that comes from the ground. Water that I vow to try and protect. A vow given to my white-tipped spirit guide, last consulted along the asphalt road on a hot Texas summer day. That's the character. If I can make some sense of this chaos. The tufted titmouse, another bird I've seen this weekend. Lounging on my porch on Lone Man Creek, watching and waiting after filling the field. The gray wisps slip through the tangle of oaks and cedar. Sharp-eyed, intelligent, watchful. The titmouse with the dark crest, the tuft, claiming a seed, flitting to a nearby branch. Leading the band of chickadees, cardinals, and scrub jays, convening a meeting of my advisors as I recline in the soft rocking chair. The cooling creek conditioned breeze dancing over my tired eyes. The, the titmouse speaks to me from the limb, reminding me to be grateful for another day. Grateful for the rain that filled the creek and the lake. Grateful for the springs that keep my counselors alive. Grateful for water that defies life and well being and fun in the hill country. Water that is being removed faster than it can be replaced, vanishing, threatening all living things. It's the water, stupid, cries the titmouse to my laid back self, as the clarion call awakening me on the porch within the oak cedar scrub on Lone Man Creek. I have some great conversations with my <laughs> So I'm off bird this morning, just talking, just having the best time up there on the highest tree it could find. Jogging along the road near Wimberley on the late on the morning in late June. The bird sits at the highest point of the tallest tree, erect, poised for action, watching all, missing nothing. The white wing bars exposed in, a, in flight, confirming that I'm viewing a mockingbird. An amazing force of nature that mimics others, fooling them, yet to what purpose? Does the duplicity serve a need? Or is this mockingbird simply having fun? Mocking people are quite different. Telling you what you want to hear, singing the song of the day, pretending to be stewards, pretending to care, yet being sure to leave themselves the opening to talk differently with other people. Openings for making money, openings for selling out the springs and waters of this porous karst land, land that suffers for a lack of honest stewards that simply try to care for the church of the earth that is the Texas Hill Country. From its new treetop, the Mockingbird sings out, reminding me to be alert for the mocking people of Texas, for they sing the song of death to the hill country. And let's do one more. In the hill country, jogging down the asphalt road on a foggy morning in November. The morning is silent. The hill is draped in the soft cloak of moisture that dulls and dims the color, the shapes, the familiar forms, concealing their variety and character, rendering them all gray outlines and forms when suddenly I hear the cluck of the turkey and see motion beneath the cedar coming into view on my right. I stop and watch as a long-legged brown bird scoops out from beneath the fence and comes to the middle of the road where it stops and looks at me, first puzzled, and then realizing what I am, taking off with the blaze of speed for which it is known. Oh, how long to be swift like the road bird, escaping the wily coyotes and other predators that thrive here in the hill country, stealing our water, hijacking our springs, all there for the taking unless we are quick enough and tough enough to challenge their science and their lawyers and make them fight for every drop that they would remove from these hills for personal gain. Beep, beep, I say to the crested ground cuckoo we call a roadrunner, and I smile because today I feel fast. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or talk about any of these poems anymore or have Isabel come back up here and talk more about our art um, or read another poem or two or whatever. Yeah. How often have you been writing them? 
Well, really, since I saw him and uh, I went into Isabel's art studio, I mean, I've kind of fooled around with poetry for a long time, but we wrote our first book of poems after I walked into her art studio and saw her art on the wall and said I could write poems, and she said, we'll do it. Uh, and we published that book, I guess, what, about seven or eight years ago? So about that long. You know, if, uh, you know I've been, uh, I had written the Book of Texas Bays back in 2004, and that was really the first book I had written. Uh, you know, a lot of briefs, a lot of environmental law type of writing, but, uh, but nothing like this for, for fun. You wrote me poetry in college. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I, was, on the, I was on the personal level. Where's that book? Some of those are really good. <laughs> You know, it could be definitely a bestseller coming all over the place. Um, but no, that's about the you know, it's really been, and I, 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 I literally do it for, for my fun, for my pleasure. And it's, it's a way, great way of expressing things that I think are somewhat, um, I don't know that they're necessarily hard to express. It just gives me the freedom to kind of put a thought together with, kind of with some imagery and sort of wrap it up and put a bow around it and it's a point. And it's kind of fun. Yeah, Mike? You know, Jim, uh, continue to be amazed by your layers and commonalities. You know, one of my email addresses is bird nerd, so I've been a, a bird. Bird nerd for a while. <laughs> bird nerd for a while. Well, you know, there's a couple of bird nerds in the room. So. But what, what I appreciate about what you guys just did collectively is, you know, there's certain birds that I've always thought were indicators to Humanness uh, tied to the nature of peace, and the little birds and their innocence. Uh, I love the depth of how that speaks. Uh, there's a lot of power in that. Well, God, I appreciate that. Uh, I think I've been, uh, <coughs> a joke or two has been made about my conversations with the birds. Uh, but I mean, I really feel like I can, you know. I empathize with the inability of, of certain, starts with individuals. I mean, as an environmental lawyer, I represented a lot of people who were unable to protect themselves. Uh, I mean, Jeff Bundy, you know this as well as I do with the work that you do, um, that it's a real sense of protection that you get to feel as a lawyer reaching out and helping someone. But then you think about nature. And you know, the, you know, the birds can't speak for them. And yet we have these wonderful, fanciful discussions back and forth where they bring their concerns. And you know, it's kind of fun, uh, and perhaps crazy. Uh, but it's kind of the way I relax and enjoy myself on the porch and uh, the birds are out there and, and they sort of become friends. And then Isabel just captures them so gorgeously. Tell a little bit about portraits of these birds, because what you did with the first, you know, with, the, with many of the, the, the birds on the box, was really you were capturing the bird as a, you know, kind of the important person. Well, I think that'd be redundant to say it again, but um, we did say it earlier, but I just want to make that point again. Uh, well, I, I feel like that on a good day, I'm connected to everything. Um, so the birds, if something happens to the birds, it happens to us too. Or if something happens to the earth, it happens to us too. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I feel more connected the healthier I am. And I think that happens to the birds too. I mean, but you know, in your, in your art, you also mean, you're talking about, you know, basically giving sort of human traits to the birds. Isabel Park gives human traits to the birds as well. Yeah, my birds are not realistic. You can recognize them, but they're not realistic. I'm not a, a nature painter. I'm Could it fool me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but her birds smile. 
Her, her birds, you know, have, have litter around their eyes. And their eyes, you know, brighten up. I mean, it, it, it is a fun bird to be associated with. I love that you chose it. between us and the and those that are less able to protect themselves. And you know, that's kind of what kind of is motivated. Susan. So Jim, you're talking about the innocence of birth. It reminded me that um, back during the BPO film when that was happening, the the image of a of a pelican struggling in the surf that was kind of covered with oil became this iconic image. I think it was so galvanized to the public. And I, I remember being in the grocery store just at Randall down the street during that spill, which went on for you know, almost three months. And, and this woman was saying to another woman, I don't know, I just want to go wash birds. And, and it was just like, which is something you can't do, you know, it was like that specialty. But, um, but it just, it just, just reminded me of, of both the kind of innocence of, because what that image said to me was, this bird doesn't want to but it's just covered in oil and it's struggling to come. Well, I mean, that's the way, that's that scrub jay to me. I mean, yeah. Whereas, you know, you hear a scrub jay and it just is screaming out across this landscape. And, and you know, nobody would except for the hawks and then everybody hides. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, that jay is, is, is sort of, you know, in charge of that domain in the, in the jay's mind, I think, because of his experience. And yet those forces that are coming are going to transform that environment. And uh, I'll, I'll finish up here in a minute with one other poem, uh, but about you know, this water. I mean, the seeps, the springs, the, the overall way that the hill country works, it's where the birds get their water. They don't like to go down to the big open spaces and, and where they like to just kind of find the small nooks and crannies and hop down and get some water and hop back up. And uh, they don't like to be exposed out there because those hawks are around. And, uh, you know, if, if you only have left one big pool of water to go to, then that's where all of the, uh, the danger lies. Mm -hmm. Bobby? Uh, that carrot carol poem, I love, that's my favorite one in the whole book. I, I love mm -hmm. that. Uh, but that poem about the mocking bird and the mocking people, people it's, I actually find it very dismantling. It makes me cry every time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, as uh, such an incredible environmental activist and lawyer. Do you do you find that you write when you're the angriest as a way of balancing that, or do you find you write when you're most connected? It sounded like you're. It's not anger. It, it's really the, the connectedness, much more so. It's much more of a positive kind of feeling. The, the anger comes out in things I throw away, probably. Uh, but, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm not angry like I used to be. Uh, it, I'm much more uh, kind of reflective about it and thinking about what's it going to take for humans to figure out how to move forward to a different place where we are now. And so the spiritual side is something that I keep coming back to because that spiritual side uh, can be incredibly powerful. And if it were harnessed and moved toward the earth, I mean, I've, I've studied all the religions of the world 
to try to understand back when I was a practicing environmental lawyer, I kept thinking I'd have a chance to make a jury argument that, that might have a couple of jury with some Baptists on it. <laughs> trying to figure out how do you talk to the Baptists about protecting the earth? Well, if God said to protect it, that would help. You know, we've got the Pope saying that now. Uh, you know, the Pope's encyclical is incredibly strong. So trying to figure out that, you know, both the organized and the personal side of spirituality. I, I think is where I see a lot of hope, and and it's stewards, good stewards. And one of the poems in here celebrates uh, really a ranch that has a conservation easement. And just as a tip of the hat to the brancher that did that. Uh, yeah, we don't we don't talk enough about the good things that people do. And, uh, and so I'm trying to reinforce those those ideas while tweaking the conscience. Yeah, okay. Uh, the, what I found so compelling was that you moved from the head to the heart to the spirit so that there's more connection. Because as an advocate, I found that, that the head and the analysis didn't matter much. It, even if you said, look, you got seven years tipping point, <laughs> you do or die, it didn't matter. It's like it's got to be heartfelt. You do such an inviting job of, of bringing that together. And I think the whole idea of us being one, see ourselves as one, not only with nature, but with each other. You know, in my lifetime, I've never had as much divisiveness, as much negativity, as much uh, pollution of relationships uh, in our environment. It's, it's right now. You know, I want to bring back the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think we're probably on the verge of something like that happening. You know, and I mean, if you, if you lived through the 60s, if you it's, it's certainly I did, it was a hard time. Yes. I mean, it was not a pleasant time. It was probably the hardest time I've ever had in terms of making personal judgments about who I am and what I stand for. I had a father that was a Marine. And we had the Vietnam War, and you had all of the different forces coming. And for me, it was just an amazingly um, difficult time. And I think that we are in the midst of that. And I think that the antidote for it has got to be uh, positivity. It's got to be. When we read your poems today at our uh, church, we organized all the Sunday school classes to do a nature adventure. And so they got to go see the wildflowers and the butterflies, et cetera. And then come back and John was there and meditated on, you know, and read the uh, cedar waxwing. Oh, you read the waxwing, yes. okay. Because it's so compelling when you have a hands on kind of experience. And four years ago, I tried to organize faith based groups to do something and it just too hard, and you know I'm hoping you know where I see it right now. This year is the most traction I've seen since uh, January, so I'm hopeful. Well, good. I, I that those like bird calls are waking up. <laughs> yeah, well, up. those birds were, were busy talking this morning. But they were. I mean, I, I gotta say, I mean, probably one reason uh, there were many reasons I wasn't great in law school, but. Perhaps the most important one was that there's no heart in a lot of the law that I studied, and in a lot of the way that law is taught, there's not much heart. And, and in, in environmental law, practicing on the environmental side, I got a chance to basically live what I thought, and, and so my heart. And I will say it helped that my uh, my wife Garland over here made some money to allow me to do some of the things I did, uh, but. Um, it, it was really nice, though, to be able to pursue heart as well as, as head. And I uh, got a chance to say something, show something. Any other questions? If not, let me just go for one more if I can, can find it. Look at the page number. Just endangered species kind of holds a special place. And I'll finish with one about the endangered species. Uh, but I've got to find it. So 
the black cat very well. And I, I'm, I'm nice to myself in these poems. It's the nice thing about writing them, it's you get to be nice to yourself. The Black Cat Vireo. Walking near Lone Man Creek in late spring, the rains came to the hill country last week, soaking, penetrating rains that brought us water that found the seams within the limestone shelves. Seams that slowly leak life-giving water that is open and available to the small vireo with the black cat that flits down to the natural cup and drinks the life-giving elixir. A vireo that has a special status, a vireo that is labeled by our actions, a vireo that is in danger. I visualize this lovely living thing landing to sip and see the essence of life, the essence of existence on this beautiful place we call Earth, a place inhabited by a pervasive magical spirit that creates life that exists nowhere else. Life that is fragile, like a flame that needs tending. And I get it. We are all called to be keepers of the flame of life, protectors of things endangered and under attack, protectors of those unable to act to protect themselves. And at night, the black cat messenger comes to me and wraps me in his wings and says thank you. That's all I've got. And thanks to the artist for illustrating this.